So we're back. Episode number two. Maybe it's going to be a thing. We'll see. Um, I just want to say thanks to everyone for watching the last video. Um, it was good to get some feedback from people. Um, a lot of positive feedback, which was good. Uh, some people were saying that they could really relate to um, the things I was saying about my creative pursuit experiences uh, to their own life. So that was cool. You know, a lot of people saying like, yeah, I've, I've experienced a lot of the same thing, like trying to get over these hurdles of, uh, you know, like people um, uh, feeling like they can't do something because they'll be judged for it. So it was good. A lot of people relating and um, maybe helping them. I'm not really sure. Uh, my sister told me that it was, <laughs> I need to be less uh, sad or boring. <laughs> so shit, sorry, but, um, you know, I, I, I think the more comfortable I get with doing this, the more like exciting I can be, I guess. But at the same time, I want it to be realistic. Like it's, um, I'm not trying to put on a show. I'm just trying to be authentic, I guess. Um, some people commented on the length of the video. Um, what I would say to that is that I guess being that I'm uploading it on a YouTube channel where I've got some shorter videos, it seems like it was meant to be a video about a certain thing, like about the topics that I was talking about. But yeah, the intention is for it to be a podcast. So, um, if you're new to podcasts, I guess it's just something that you would listen to in the background when you're driving or working or doing some cleaning or going for a run or something. Um, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, solve some particular problem. I'm just talking about stuff. So it's just, yeah, if you want to listen in or if you feel like listening to something, um, that's what it's all about. So yeah, it's going to be long. The last one I think was 45 minutes and I'm aiming to have them around an hour. Like mod most podcasts are between an hour to an hour and a half or two hours. Or if you're Joe Rogan, they're like four hours. <laughs> but yeah, I'm aiming to get around an hour. So I'm timing this one. Um, what else have I got here? Uh, yeah, so these videos, um, which I'm calling How Original, um, as podcasts i'm going to put them in a different playlist so they'll be like the podcast playlist and uh when i other when i upload other videos they'll just be in the general feed so you can distinguish between them and I, I'll, I'll do some different colored thumbnails um, i'll update the thumbnails that are on there now so that it's more obvious which are the ones that are intended to be um, a video with a purpose and which are meant to be just a talking video and yeah, these are different because I'm not putting so much effort into like um, constructing a script and like my other shorter videos, um, I actually chop up the, there's a lot of cuts in there and you might think that that's fake, you know, compared to this, which is a lot more authentic. But the, the point of doing that is just to make a shorter video, which you can focus on, um, it, yeah, it doesn't get so boring like this. And it's meant to just get across all the information in an efficient amount of time. Um, so I'm not wasting your time. But yeah, with these ones, the goal is to talk for a long time and edit very little. Um, the last episode I edited, I think I did three cuts. And it was because at one point the light went out, <laughs> this one here. Uh, and at one point I checked how long I was going for and I don't know. I think at one point I just had a extremely long, awkwardly long pause and I was like, oh, I'm going to cut that out. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm aiming to get to the point where it's just me chatting for an hour or something. And I just put it on the computer, um, do some, you know, fix up the colors or the brightness or whatever, and then just upload it. Um, so yeah. Uh, at this point, I think there's like 25 people <laughs> subscribed, which is, um, I don't know how to take that. I guess it's, uh, you know, it's a milestone for me, but it's pretty low at the same time, but you know, I'm climbing up there very slowly. 
Um, so this episode, I wanted to talk about um, more about Germany, why I'm here, um, why I came here. Uh, so yeah, why I came here, what I like about Germany, what I don't like about Germany, how it compares to living in Australia. Um, so I've written a bunch of notes, um, and I've tried to organize it in some, some kind of a compliment sandwich. If you've heard of that term, um, I'm going to talk about the, you know, the things that were appealing to me in the beginning about Germany the reasons why I decided to move here. And then I'll talk about the things that I've discovered since living here that I don't like, but then I'll finish on something positive, which is the stuff that I've learned that I really do like about this place. Uh, so yeah, that's the idea. Um, so yeah, I've got a bunch of notes here. I don't want to, I'm just checking the time because I, yeah, I don't know how long this is going to go. Well, let's go. So why Germany? Um, while I was studying at uni, uh, like I mentioned in the last video, I discovered that I've got these two sort of main um, passions in my life. And one of them is design and one of them is music. And I was feeling a lot like, even after I finished uni working and stuff, that those two worlds were very separate and that that was kind of amplifying like this thing that I was talking about in the last video where I'm having to split my time between different, different areas of my interest. Um, the fact that I was so involved in music and so involved in design in two totally different areas that felt like it was really splitting my, um, my attention. And what I ha had envisioned in my mind is that if I can work for an industry or for a company that is designing music related products, then that brings those two worlds much closer together. So that way I'm doing design, which is something I'm really good at in a music world. So I'm surrounding myself with other musicians, which means that I'm, I'm meeting people I can jam with and all that kind of stuff. So that was my idea. Um, and the things that drew me to Germany was that I knew, um, you know, Germany has a good music scene and there's a good design and engineering, um, seen here, I guess, or, you know, when you think of Germany, you think that they're really efficient and they have like really good technology and engineering and everything. And that they're really clever and efficient and all that kind of stuff. So I knew like there was a lot of really nice, um, high quality design stuff happening in Germany and engineering stuff. And that they're, you know, sort of at the forefront of engineering in some aspects, like when it comes to automotive engineering and stuff, all, you know, a lot of really great car companies are based in Germany. So it had that going for it. I knew that there was this respectable design and, and engineering world here. Um, so I, yeah, like I said, I went traveling in 2018, went to a bunch of different countries and because I had an inkling that I was going to like Germany, I decided to come here last. So it would be my last impression. But there were a few other places where I thought um, that could be good options to other places to live that sort of tick the same boxes. One of those was Stockholm in Sweden. Um, I've got a good friend that lives there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he knows some people who work for or work as engineers for some good companies that said they could help me find a job over there. But um, like the music scene is not so prevalent over there. They've got um, a good, yeah, they've, they have, there's some impressive engineering and design companies there, but I, I wasn't finding there was much um, in the way of music, but maybe I just was in the, the wrong circles or whatever, but that was just my impression. Uh, but yeah, there were some other places. Um, yeah, some other places which maybe were more suited to music and things, but maybe not so nice to live in. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, I landed in Berlin. I ended up in Berlin in, in the end. Um, and I spent a few weeks here, uh, I think three weeks, and I met some people and went and experienced all the 
you know, as I tried to take in as much of the culture as I could, like going around and seeing, um, you know, street art and going to, uh, you know, exhibitions and galleries and that kind of thing. And also trying to find music events to go to, which ended up mostly just being clubbing. But as I don't know, it's kind of hard to find like cool events to go to when you don't know so many people in a place. But yeah, I did. I did know one guy before moving here and went to some good clubbing events with him, which was awesome. And then ended up meeting some other people in a club. One of those people I now live with. Um, so it's a funny story to tell your parents that uh, you're moving to the other side of the world um, and you're going to be living with somebody that you met in a techno club. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, she's a, she's a cool, very normal, very not crazy you know she loves techno but she's uh, a very nice person so i'm really uh, lucky to have met some people like that who are really helpful and and sort of welcomed me into their friend group and um were willing to help me out with moving over here and then it just happened that um she had a space in this apartment uh free becoming free at the time when i wanted to move here so it was just perfect i just sort of lined it up and said look i will start paying rent early because it will make life much easier for me so i was really lucky in that regard because um, finding apartments here can be really difficult but yeah i ended up just flying straight over here and moving directly in but yeah so the from that three weeks that i spent here in the beginning when i was traveling um what i realized that i like was yeah there is you know design and engineering companies here um there's awesome music art culture clubbing all of that kind of stuff um and there's just <laughs> i've written here vibe um it's kind of an annoying buzzword but yeah there is kind of just like a good vibe about this place like the the people that you meet and i don't know this is a really accepting kind of progressive i guess kind of place where people have a good attitude and um yeah so that was my feeling when i was here i felt like it was it was somewhere where it, i would be happy living um then i've got here perceived technology <laughs> so um when i mentioned that it's something you see germany as um being like super efficient and having all this you know, really great engineering and technology and everything. You have this idea that, yeah, like everything's probably way better over there. Everything works really well over there. And I'll go into it, but um, I think that's a, that's a big misconception. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I said that I liked uh, um, about Berlin and Germany before moving here is that um, there's not so much of a, a language barrier. Obviously, there's a huge language barrier with trying to learn German, but the majority of people are speaking English as well. Or so I thought anyway, that was the way it came across. So yeah, when I left Berlin, came back to Melbourne, all these things are in my head. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's the place where I want to be. I'm going to take a bit of time and save some money and sort out how I'm going to get myself over there. And that's what I did. So then when I moved here, um, I started realizing <laughs> some different things about Germany. So let's go into that. And I say Germany, but um, like my experiences, your experiences are going to vary in Germany because Berlin is a totally different place to the rest of Germany. And people always say that Berlin is a, a different country to the rest of Ber uh, Germany. And I've been to Nuremberg, I've been to uh, Frankfurt, I've been to, um, where else, Freiburg. Uh, I can't remember, I think, oh, I've been to Munich as well. Um, and it's true, they are sort of very different cities. There's obviously similarities and there's some things that I'm going to talk about which are relevant to all of Germany but a lot of them are relevant just to Berlin. Um, technology being one of those things. Berlin kind of feels like you've, in a way, it feels a little bit like you've 
gone through a time machine and landed in like the early 90s or something. <laughs> it's a little bit backwards in some aspects. Um, but I'll, I'll start with these points. So the first thing I noticed, which it's hard to point at whether it's different to Australia because I don't speak the language so much, so you can't really understand like all of it. But there is with some people this kind of, they call it, and some people warn you about it, it's called the German arrogance. And, you know, maybe it's rude to say that it's a generalization, but there is sort of this feeling with some people, or maybe it's just with some um, institutions or or uh, businesses or, you know, there's some aspects of or areas of business where people have this particular attitude which can be kind of exclusive, especially to a traveler or to a, uh, an expat. Um you know, in some places, people will flat out refuse to speak English with you, even if they actually do speak English, which it's understandable in some ways, like um, like in government offices, for example, um, like you have the local burger app for like which, the area that you're living in, which is kind of just like where you do all your registration of your address and that kind of thing. And some people there are quite nice, but then sometimes you met with someone who, you know, you walk in and everyone is speaking German around you and you, you kind of like standing there with this piece of paper that you can't read and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, is it possible to speak English? And they're like, nein, <laughs> Deutschland. <laughs> like, you know, they're saying a bunch of stuff that I can't understand, but I can, what I can understand is that they're saying, Deutsch, we speak, you know, we speak German. This is Germany here, we speak German. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Um... Yeah, so that doesn't happen all the time, but it is a thing with some people <laughs> that I wasn't expecting. So, yeah, sometimes you just have to, um, you're not expecting that to happen, but sometimes you do find people like that. And if you stay calm and get Google Translate out and just write things out, it's mostly fine. But, yeah, that was something that can be annoying, especially if I've had the same problem with um, trying to set up like phone plans and stuff. Because you call the support line and you ask the same thing, like, I'm sorry, is it possible if we speak English? And there's not even a response because whether it's just that they're being told by their boss that they're not allowed to speak English, and there's a reason for that, which I'll explain, or whether they don't speak English at all, it's, yeah, it's, and I don't blame them for not speaking English because it is Germany. Like, you it's, you know, it's bullshit for somebody who speaks English to come to a non-English speaking country and be like, why don't you speak English? Because they don't have to. It's my fault that I don't speak German. But um, yeah, it's kind of annoying sometimes just because you're like, oh, fuck, what do I do? Like, <laughs> I don't know how to speak to this person. But I'm lucky that I live with someone who speaks German. So she's been able to help me out heaps with that. So, But yeah, so um, that was just... A a counter to that point that I made of one of the reasons why I moved here is because of language. Um, something that I've noticed is that, you know, sometimes the language can actually still be a big barrier, but most of the time it's okay. But the reason why I said um, sometimes people aren't allowed to speak English is I guess if a company, especially if it's government, but if somebody working at a company who speaks German and they can speak English, but they're not like trained to speak English. If they give advice in English and they don't put across that advice, you know, if they don't give a, give that information accurately, then I guess somebody could interpret it the wrong way. And it's kind of like you're giving somebody misleading information. If you can't be 100% confident that you're qualified to speak English, then you can't, as an employer, guarantee that this person is giving the right information. So they could be misleading people. So that's, I guess, why they they tell them not to speak English because they don't want people to be misled. Um, the second thing I wrote is driving. Um, I've got a new setup here, by the way, so I can move my microphone around. I just need to get new lights now that I don't die. So yeah, I've written driving. Um, 
driving here, it's good actually. You can um, you can transfer an Australian driver's license into German. All you have to do is take it to. Actually, I haven't transferred mine yet. I, you can do another thing, which I did, which is you can get a translation of your driver's license from the ADAC, which is kind of like a, a insurance place. And you can use that for six months. And then if you take your actual driver's license to the place where you get a German license, they'll take it and you can pay like 30 euros or something and they'll actually give you a German license and you don't have to do a test or anything. So that's really good. That should be something I should mention is a good thing here. Um, but actually driving here, the first time I drove, obviously it's weird to get used to because you're driving on the opposite side of the road and the seat, the driver's seat in the car is on the opposite side. But I felt like, um, I'd played enough Grand Theft Auto to, <laughs> to have kind of a grasp of driving on the opposite side. And also I got a bike and I started riding my bike around before I started driving, which kind of gets you used to being on that side of the road a little bit. Um, but yeah, once you do it a couple of times, it's fine. But what I will mention that this is the reason why I put it in the don't like section is that so many of the roads here are either not labeled with a, a, um, a speed, you know, a speed sign. But most of them are 30 kilometers an hour as the speed limit, which is, I don't know, for me, it's just like painfully slow. I guess on the plus side, that's really good for bike riders because it makes it safer. But the th the problem is I know most of the time it's 30 k's an hour. And then when you don't see a sign for ages, you're driving along at 30 kilometers an hour like, and someone will go past you faster and you're like, am I allowed to go faster here? I have no idea. And I don't know, it seems like it's more scary to get a... Uh, pulled over by police or something here because I know how much of a drama it's going to be because I'm not going to understand what they're saying or anything. So I'm really trying not to get in trouble. So I'm like driving super slow and I'm like, can I go faster? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, that's something that's annoying. Um, the next thing I put here was food. Now there is lots of good places to get food here, but the supermarkets I found, uh, I don't know, if you live in Australia and you've been to Aldi, like Aldi is like kind of a typical supermarket here. There are nicer supermarkets than Aldi, but it's kind of that uh, vibe of like minimum range and just like maximum simplicity for, and efficiency for the people that work there. Like, you know, bringing the boxes in, just opening the box, putting it on the shelf. But there's so many things like that I forget how like you take it for granted in Australia how much different stuff we have available to us. And when you hear you like, I just want peanut butter. Like, why can't I find peanut butter anywhere? Like, it's not something I eat very often, but occasionally you're like, yeah, I could go for some peanut butter. And then you have to look through like three supermarkets to find somewhere that has peanut butter. And then the lack of Asian food too is really apparent, especially coming from Australia where we have, you know, the, the average Australian is half half descendant from an Asian country. We have so much Asian influence and so much amazing Asian food and it's just so much more rare here. So because of that, you end up eating like way more gluten and <laughs> dairy and stuff, like so much bread and pasta. And, um, you know, sometimes I'm just craving like a, a rice meal. But there are like some really good Vietnamese restaurants and stuff here. But in the supermarkets, like just trying to find things like curries or... Um, stir fry stuff or any of that kind of Asian sort of stuff. It's like there might be one option or like two options. Whereas like if you go to a, a big Coles in Melbourne, there's like a whole aisle, which is like uh, import stuff. And it's like all different Asian products, which I miss that. <laughs> um, and then there's also, you know, like the fresh produce and stuff. Uh, I guess if you go to the more expensive supermarkets, you can find it. But I just found in general, the, the produce is a bit more rough, I guess. But, you know, we've got so much space in Australia for agriculture that it makes sense. Um, and no, I wrote no plain Doritos because <laughs> I like the, the green Doritos with the just the salt on them and they don't have them here. I don't know why. The other really weird thing, this... It does my head in and 
it's not important at all. But I just, it, I don't understand why. But with Doritos, in Australia, like the red ones are like supreme cheese and the yellow ones are um, nacho cheese. And here, for some reason, the red ones are nacho cheese. And then the orange ones, which is normally like Mexican, Mexicano or something in Australia, like the orange ones are something totally different here. I'm like, what? I, you know, I get it. Like the colors doesn't matter, but it's the same company. <laughs> so, why does the same company in one country, that color means this flavor and in another country, that color means another flavor when it's like, like, do they test in each country like which color is appropriate to which flavor it's just really i don't know i don't get it because it's the same company it's really strange and it doesn't matter at all but i just thought it was weird um next thing i wrote here is the second hand market so obviously coming here from from you know just having a backpack full of clothes um i had to buy everything again and there's some things you don't want to buy new like i bought a lot of like furniture and stuff just from Ikea, but there's certain things like I wanted a bike and stuff. I didn't want to pay for a brand new bike. And the secondhand market for whatever reason is just like ridiculously expensive. People just have this expe expectation that they can charge like 90% of the new price for something. And yeah, I don't know. I guess that the, it doesn't seem like there's much secondhand stuff for sale. So I guess people just haven't realized that if you, if a buyer is looking at something and it's like, mm, it cost 50 bucks, but if I buy it new, it's like 60 bucks. I'm just going to buy it new. I think people just haven't realized that yet. <laughs> it's like, you know, I feel like a general rule of thumb for most things secondhand is like you halve the price. And then if no one's interested, you like drop it a little bit more. Or with some things like, you know, like studio monitors and stuff, you can maybe get away with like 70% of the new price. But even that, I feel like it's still asking a lot. So I don't know. That's something that frustrates me. Um, then I've got here compulsory radio and television. And anyone who lives here that I've met, um, and any Germans even, they get it as well. It's so f fucking annoying. The... Well, the company's called ZDF or I don't know how they say it in German. They pronounce all the letters differently. <laughs> I am learning German, by the way, um, just very slowly. Um, but yeah, so basically what happens? You move into an apartment here. You get settled in. You figure out you've got to register your address with the government office and everything. You do that and you're like, all right, sweet. I'm set now. And all of a sudden you get this letter in the mail and it's the television and radio service and you're like ah, oh, i don't want that like it doesn't matter to me but no you can't say that because <laughs> it's compulsory if you live here that you have to pay for this radio and television service regardless of whether you own a radio or a television or even have a radio or a television port like a, an antenna port in your house you have to pay for this service which it's just complete bullshit like that yeah, I don't know. The bureaucracy here is crazy. And it, I guess, um, yeah, the government's going to make their money somehow. But that is just really shitty to me that you would have, you know, a service that you're not using and you can't even elect to not use it. You can't prove that you're not using it and not pay for it. You just have to pay for it. So whatever. Um, now, this one is more specific to Berlin. Because if you go to other um, cities in Germany, there's some really beautiful places in Germany. Like um, Freiburg, for example, is amazing. Like I went hiking around, um, I can't remember the name of the mountain, but there's a, a mountain really close to Freiburg, which used to be a, a mine. I think they mined like silver and lead and stuff there. And walking down that mountain, like there was this path that follows this creek and all these plants and everything. And I was walking along there, just looking around, taking photos of everything, just being like, this is like Alice in Wonderland shit. Like it looks amazing. It's, it's yeah, it's like the nature is just really stunning there. But in Berlin, 
<laughs> it's really not like that at all. Um, there's a, I've written here, there's a, a real roughness. It's Berlin is very rough around the edges and everyone knows this. Like you, it's what you expect. You'd know that before you move here. It's a very sort of gray city and it's very dirty and, and ugly. And part of that is because, you know, it was occupied by Soviets for so long and all the buildings were just, you know, communist block buildings and stuff. But some of the buildings are nice, but it's just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I guess it's a, even though it's the capital city of Berlin, it's, um, sorry, the capital city of Germany, Berlin itself feels like quite a, not a very affluent city, like it's a poor city. And maybe that's because everyone here is like a, a failed aspiring musician or, <laughs> you know, and from that, you've got a lot of homeless people and a lot of, you know, people doing drugs on the street or selling drugs on the street and stuff, which I don't want to comment too much on that, but, you know, I can't say whether that's the fault of the people or whether that's the fault of the city for not helping them, but, you know, whatever the reason is, that's the way it is. Um, but yeah, I would just say something that surprised me was um, like the lack of maintenance. Like it could be quite a nice city and it is like, you know, it's a first world city. Like everything's great here, but it's just, you know, a bit rough. <laughs> like um, something I'll say that I noticed is that generally like the roads are pretty rough, like especially if you... I don't know. It's kind of a double-edged sword because if you ride a bike, it's actually quite good here because most roads have a space specifically for bikes to be in, or there'll be an actual bike path on the footpath. So you're actually completely off the road, which is like, you know, that's ideal for a bike rider. It can be annoying for pedestrians, especially if you're a pedestrian from a, a place like Australia, where we generally don't have footpaths, a uh, bike paths on the footpath. You get a lot of people, especially tourists, when you're riding your bike, will just be standing there with their backpack in the middle of the footpath, the bike path, and you're ringing the bell like, "Get, come on, get out of the way." <laughs> um, but yeah, it is really nice. Like most places, there is a good space for bikes to to be on the footpath, and it means that you know you don't have this hatred between b bike riders and drivers because you're sharing the same place, and you know. A lot of the time drivers get annoyed with bike riders not just because they are doing annoying things but people don't want to hurt somebody on a bike so it's annoying to you know have to be like looking out for some other people constantly so in that sense like yeah berlin is kind of similar to like amsterdam or something where there's a lot of infrastructure for riding bikes but what i will say is that the actual surface of the roads and the footpaths and stuff that you're riding on is you know, it was probably good when they made it, but it's just so infrequently maintained that, um, you know, there's, it's always like bumpy tiles or like there's a lot of roads with cobblestone and stuff, which is nice because that has its own aesthetic thing. But there's a lot of roads with big potholes and cracks and stuff in them. And the thing that actually I find annoying, just maybe it's just around this area, is that they never have that like smooth transition when you're at like a crosswalk across, to cross a road it kind of just like drops off the gutter. <laughs> so, and that seems like yeah, super first world problem, but it's annoying because on my bike, there's like a, a, a light at the back that has this little old school like halogen globe. And every time you like ride off a gutter, which you have to do every time you cross a road, it shakes this globe on the back and it ends up just bursting the globe. So you buy a globe and it lasts for about two days and then you go down a gutter once and it's it's gone. <laughs> yeah, that's my little bitch about um, the maintenance here. But on the other hand, there is always construction happening. I think the construction is just really slow. Uh, but maintenance-wise, like street sweepers, for example, I've been here for almost, I don't know, like seven months or something, and I think I've seen two street sweepers. Whereas in Melbourne, like in the CBD, you've got sweep, street sweepers run through the city, I guess, every night. Um so yeah, that's, that kind of plays into this thing that like, you know, it is a very similar city and it would be just as nice 
if there was just like constant maintenance, like just a street sweeper to run through places, pick up all the broken glass and shit that's on the floor. But yeah, there is a lot of broken glass. Like it was really evident um, after New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve, the next day, because everyone goes crazy with fireworks, the next day the streets were just completely littered with um, fireworks, like the cardboard tubes and champagne bottles and broken glass and shit everywhere. And I was like, wow, really? People really partied last night. I was like, oh, well, well, I guess I'll, I'll clean it up. They didn't. <laughs> it was like, you know, three days later, um, I was at Aldi and even just the car park in Aldi was just like covered in broken glass and stuff. I'm like, I I understand, you know, if there's not the money for the city to be going around and cleaning up stuff, but I would have thought like the people working at Aldi would have been like, hey guys, like, um, you know, obviously New Year's just happened the car park's really dirty. I need one of you guys to like go and sweep up stuff in the car park, but it's just like, yeah, whatever, we'll just leave it. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a bit of a shock for me, especially because, and I will talk about later, that the the waste management system here is actually really amazing. And that's why it was a shock for me that on this one day, people would let the streets just be filled with trash for so long and then not do anything about it for three days. So, yeah, it's a bit weird. Um, uh, so, yeah, and I've written like, you know, this is Berlin specific as well, just like the the nature and the parks and stuff. Yeah, there's some nice parks, like big parks, I mean, with like, you know, lots of space and everything, but generally just like the maintenance of the parks is kind of like the grass is always a little bit gross and the footpath kind of gets covered in leaves and then the leaves sort of rot and that just kind of turns into marsh and dirt on the footpath, which is like, I get it. Yeah, super first world problem. But I just look at these places and I'm like, this would be so nice if they just had someone like come through and just clean the paths and look after the lawns and stuff. Like it would be a beautiful park. But yeah, I get it. There's just not the money for it. But yeah, I just thought I would mention it because... I'm comparing two cities or two countries and yeah, that's not consistent across Germany. There's most other cities in Germany are beautiful, but I, that is something I should mention about Berlin as it's rough around the edges. And if you're somebody who needs to be out in nature all the time and enjoying, you know, gardens and parks and stuff, then maybe <laughs> Berlin's not the place for you because you kind of have to get used to like the, the grimness of it. <laughs> But yeah, it is really, it shines in other aspects like, um, you know, the, the, the events and the music and culture and everything. So you just don't expect to be visually impressed by Berlin. I mean, maybe the street art and stuff is visually impressive. Like in, yeah, it's a more of an industrial looking city. Um, but yeah, don't expect it to be a beautiful city. <laughs> uh, and in terms of animals, there's not really like many animals i've seen some foxes and stuff but something uh, me and my housemate noticed the other day was in the park there was these ducks um and the ducks are i think from japan or something they're called mandarin ducks and they're really cool <laughs> cool looking actually it's the coolest animal i've seen here never seen one before but they look like a toy like they're made of plastic but yeah that's cool uh, i need to speed up because i'm already at about 40 minutes uh, and I need to get to the good stuff because I don't want it to be just a whinge this whole time. Trust me, there are good things about Berlin and Germany. I am just thought I would cover both sides. Um, the weather, this is obvious. I mean, living in Central Europe, like it's, it's a lot further away from the equator than... Uh, I don't know, actually, maybe it's not. But yeah, you know, you get it. It's cold. It rains a lot. It's always wet. Basically all of winter, like you get to a point where you look at the ground and you're like, I can't remember the last time the ground was dry. Like, I can't remember there not being a puddle there. That puddle's been there for six months. <laughs> and yeah, that can be kind of depressing, but you get used to it. Um, but yeah, this, the weather in summer is pretty nice. Uh, I thought I should talk a little bit about the 
coronavirus. Um, even though I, yeah, I don't want to talk about it for too long because I think people are talking about it too much. And I'm I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of it. I think we should listen to what everyone's, you know, all the things that have been recommended to us and stay inside and everything. But um, I just thought I'd talk about how it, obviously I can't compare because I haven't been to Australia in this pandemic, but um, it feels to me a little bit like, obviously Germany, the numbers are growing much more than Australia. And we've got a much more dense population in Germany than in Australia. So it makes sense. And, you know, there's so many countries around. So, and it's obviously Europe is much more of an epicenter, whereas Australia is completely isolated. I just feel a little bit like um, this is something that I think is consistent with like the, the waste management stuff. Um, with the coronavirus, I feel like the government is doing the right things, although I, I haven't been paying too much attention to the news because most of it I can't understand. But I feel like the government is making mostly the right moves and telling people the right things, you know, giving the right advice and stuff. But And maybe it's just in Berlin, but when I look outside, it feels like the, the general public um, just mostly ignoring all of the advice, really. Like, um, you know, people are still going into the parks and hanging out in big groups and playing volleyball and stuff. Even though we do have restrictions here that you can't be in a group of more than two, technically you're only supposed to go outside for, you know, uh, groceries, doctor's appointments or exercise. And yeah, I guess going to the park is exercise, but like people are trying to use this outdoor gym where it's all like chin-up bars and stuff where you're touching all the same surfaces as other people, which is obviously like a dumb thing to do. And they taped off the outdoor gym and people just pulled the tape off and just went in there and kept using it. And it's like, all right, like, you know, you can see the tape there and you're looking at these people like, you serious? Like you're that desperate to do some chin-ups? So they actually had to end up putting construction, metal construction fences around this outdoor gym and around the playgrounds and stuff, which I kind of feel like it's just a bit shitty that they have to go to such lengths to stop people from doing something that's fairly obvious. Like, you know, I get it. A lot of people, you know, some people think it's a conspiracy or, or some people think that we're overreacting and that um, we shouldn't be damaging the economy by making everything shut down but like at the end of the day it's not that big of a deal like it's not that hard to just listen and just do what you're supposed to do and just chill out inside for a while it's not like we're living in world war Two, where you know you, like there's been much much tougher times than this and i get a lot of people you know don't have income and all that kind of stuff but you can manage there's systems put in place by the government to help out with people so i would just say it's a bit disappointing the way people are acting here and i don't know what it's like in australia but i just thought i'd mention that um three more things about in the bad section um one of them th this is i'm torn here and it's a dumb little practical thing but the the powerpoints like the the wall sockets the the actual plug is cool because you can reverse it like you can put it in it's just two pins so you can put it in upside down and that's cool but the the port don't the ports don't have an on off switch on them which i guess it's just normal here like when i've mentioned that to people they're like oh like you can have a switch on there i was like so that's something i think is nicer in australia that you can you have the switches on the powerpoints because they don't have that here and the other thing is like on a, on a power board, a, um, I don't know what it's called. Like, I forget what Americans call it, like a socket adapter thing with like multiple plugs. Um, in Australia, they have on the back, like those two little holes that kind of have a, a top section on the hole. So what you can do is put two screws in a wall and then you just put the power board, put, line up the holes and then just click it in and it stays there. And I just thought that that was standard because I'm pretty sure that's on every power board. And yeah, I totally get that this is like technical brain, just a pointless thing to even mention. Um, but yeah, I, I'm finding it really frustrating because none of the power boards here have that. 
and um yeah you like you can only like double sided th- like i just want to stick it on the bottom of my desk it's just an organization crazy person thing but yeah that's annoying <laughs> Um, the second last thing is technology. And I wrote this because, yeah, one of my impressions before coming here was that the technology was super advanced and that everything's super efficient and everything, but it's really not like that. And I think this is Berlin specific for one thing. Most places don't have FPOS, don't take cards for payment, which is super annoying for me. I hate carrying cash. Um, I hate coins, especially coins are just gross, but yeah, like all the like corner stores and the, basically the only place where it takes cards is su- supermarkets, like all the corner stores, restaurants, bars, all that kind of stuff. They won't generally don't accept cards. And, um, like the, the, the public transport, they still use like all the train trains and trams and stuff look like they were made in the nineties. <laughs> And they still have like ticket machines in the tram to like buy a physical paper ticket and you have to go and take it to the thing and like validate it and stuff. And it's like, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm sounding a bit braggy because we've got like the MyKey system, which is way easier. But I will say you can get um, tickets on your phone here, which is pretty easy. But I just thought I would say like that's kind of a, a um, it kind of highlights that there isn't this thing with technology here. Like I've heard in Nuremberg and I've been to Nuremberg, but I just can't remember if I saw them, but I heard they had like self-driving trams in Nuremberg, which obviously that's like super advanced. So that's why I'm saying it's Berlin specific. Berlin is kind of like this little hole in the middle of Germany, which everything is old school. (laughs) Um, And another element of that, like the last point I've got here is the bureaucracy bureaucracy and just like all the government related stuff is so difficult here and it's related to technology because just something like getting your and melding like just um it's registering your address all they need is your name and where you're living and then they know okay this person lives here that's basically all it is and you give them your id or something it's something that is so simple to do online but like for whatever reason that you, there's no online form to do it, which would be super easy, like just to upload your documents and, and your ID and stuff. You have to like go into the the burger amps, the place where you go to do it. You can't just do it there. You've got to make an appointment and there's no appointments for at least two months. Like, so you have to make the appointment for like two in two months time, not to mention that technically you have to have your own melding. 14 days after arriving here and it's like okay well there's no appointments for two months so i'm not going to do it in 14 days am i and there are workarounds to it like if you call them early in the morning apparently you can get um appointments and stuff but it's just like why do they have to make it so difficult it it kind of feels like uh, i keep saying this people say berlin is a great city for startup companies and it kind of feels like the main startup company in Berlin is the government. <laughs> like, it's like they're still working out how to do this stuff. Like, you know, just put it on the website. It's not that hard. But I don't know. First world problems, once again. Um, but yeah, the bureaucracy is really annoying. For me, even though I have a working holiday visa here, to get a bank account was such a nightmare. Like, it took me over six months because none of the banks would give me an account without having a a residency permit and the residency permit should just be like um like my visa right but they wouldn't accept the visa as a residency permit so they said you've got to actually have this other thing which says this other long german word which means residence permit which meant that i had to go to another place like a foreign foreigner's office and book another appointment for three months time fill out all these other forms and get all these um you know you have to prove how much money you have and that you've got insurance and all this other stuff and then go to the appointment and then pay them 60 euros so that they'll give you another sticker in your passport and then after all of that i call up this bank again and do the verification like okay i've 
you know, it's been three, three months since I've tried this. I've got this sticker now. Give me a bank account so I can give you all of my money. And they're like, no, we don't accept the sticker kind. You've got to have a plastic card. It's like, they don't give me the plastic card. I asked them for the plastic card and they're like, no, you can't have a plastic card because you're not a, a permanent resident or whatever. So it's like, why do you have um, the ability, like why do you give people a working holiday visa if when you get to Germany, you can't work here? Like, I mean, you can work here, but like, you know, if you can't get a bank account, you can't really have a proper job. It just doesn't make any sense. And then on top of that, it's like, they go, yeah, you got to pay 60 euros for this sticker. So they give me this card and they're like, take this downstairs and you pay for it downstairs. And there's a machine and it has an FPOS thing. So I put the card in, it's like, you can pay for it. And I put my card into the the FPOS thing and it says it doesn't work. I asked the security guard, I'm like, what the, why isn't this not working? And he's like, oh, you have to have a German bank card to use this machine. <laughs> like, the whole reason I'm here is because I'm trying to get a German bank account and I need this residence permit to get the German bank account, but I can't pay for the residence permit without a German bank account. So it's just completely backwards. It, it seems like all of the systems contradict each other. Nothing works efficiently. Nobody, no departments communicate with each other. And it's like everything's done with paper and appointments. So in that sense, it's like totally the opposite of what you expect from Germany. It's just not efficient or high tech at all. <laughs> but yeah, maybe it's better in other cities. I don't know. But that's the end of my um, my complaints. So I'm going to calm down. <laughs> Got a little bit worked up. And I want to talk about the, the things that I like about Berlin and Germany. So for one thing, um, Berlin as a city, from my perspective, being here for this long, maybe other people think differently. But for me, it's a very progressive city. And, you know, you can think of that as like it's full of lefties and you know it's there's a lot of freedom and people people are very accepting and you can be whoever you want to be here and you can dress up however you want to dress up and you know there's a lot of acceptance for like the lgbt community and all that kind of stuff but I, i'm not just talking about that and that's really great but it's also progressive in terms of like they are apart from the technology aspects they are trying to you know, to do things in a, they are trying to make things, there's this, when I mentioned that the vibe is good here, it, you, it feels like people want, people want life to be better for people here. Like people are doing what feels best for the people. I don't know. Maybe I'm just talking out my ass, but it's like, you know, because Hitler, all the stuff happened with Hitler here, this is like the most anti-Nazi city in the world people have this like um, attitude that it's like, you know, like fuck Hitler. Like there's no monuments or anything for him here. It's like they know roughly where he died and it's like, or where his bunker or whatever it was. And it's buried underground under a bunch of, bunch of sand and rubble and stuff. And it's got some ugly apartment block or car park on top of it. Like they don't give him any recognition because it's like he doesn't deserve any recognition. So there's this like big attitude of like, you know, fuck anyone who wants to do bad to somebody, something bad to somebody else. So that's kind of what I mean. It's hard to explain, but it's, it's a feeling of like people are trying to, um, you know, they want to, they, they fight against anyone who's trying to do something shitty because they're, you know, generally trying to look after each other. So I think that's a good thing. Um, and also maybe this is more Germany specific rather than Berlin, but there I'm, I've got, you know, I wouldn't say I'm super passionate about it cause I'm not doing, I'm not so active, but I, um, I have a, I guess I will say I've got a passion for like, um, for like climate change related stuff. 
Uh, or I have an interest in it, I'll say that. Um, in terms of, I think, you know, clean energy and stuff is good and that we should avoid using um, dirty forms of electricity and, I don't know, people look at it as like you're a tree hugger or something or like you care about the environment, you want to look after all the plants and stuff. And it's like, it's not about that. It's about we want to, we want this place to be sustainable so that we can keep living here. It's not about looking after the earth. It's about keeping the earth in a condition which is good for people to live in. So, um, yeah, it's not a, it's not a tree hugger thing being a, a climate activist or something. It's just like, you know, I want it, this place to be somewhere that's good for us. It's a selfish thing, if anything, but yeah, I think, um, Germany, especially compared to Australia are doing some good things here. Um, like, um, you know, they've got a, a roadmap of their planning. I can't remember which year, but they're planning by a certain time. I'm pretty sure it's before 2025 that they want to completely be, uh, shut down all coal power stations, which I think is, a, you know, it's a pretty big move economically. Um, but it's, and it's bold, but, um, yeah, it's, it's really good that they're doing stuff like that. The waste management here is really much more intense than it is in Australia too. Although I've heard that they're trying to change that in Australia now, but like in Australia, we just have like the trash bin and then like the recycle bin, which just is everything recyclable, plastics, glass, metal, all that kind of stuff, paper here. Like there's, I think there's like, I'll have to count. I think there's at least five different bins. You got like the, the garbage bin, um, packaging, which is like plastics, foams, all that kind of stuff and paper. And then, um, I think metal goes with the packaging and then you've got like the white glass and brown glass. And I think that's it. Yeah. So I think it's five, but even just that, like, and, and I mentioned before that the Corona thing is kind of related to this waste management thing. I mean that in the sense that I think the government are doing the right thing um, in that regard, like putting in place, you know, all these different kinds of bins so that they can efficiently recycle as much stuff as possible. But I think that the general public don't manage it as well as it's intended. Um, and by that, I just mean like, I think a lot of the time people just put all the shit in the, in the trash or they put it in the, just the packaging bin or whatever. But I think most people are good with it. And the other really good thing on that aspect too, is that all the, um, the bottles here, like glass bottles and plastic bottles, you can get an actual refund for it. Like in Australia, it's, that always says like only in South Australia, you can get like five cents back for this bottle. Whereas here it's like 25 cents and that's euros. So, you know, it's almost like 50 cents in Australian dollars. Um, which is actually like, it makes it worth actually bringing them back. And a lot of people don't, but what a lot of people will do is when they finish a bottle, you don't, even if you're on the street or something, you don't just throw it in the bin. You, if it's a glass bottle, you would just put it on the ground next to the bin. And then, like I said, there's a lot of homeless people here. So the homeless people will go around with a trolley or with a bag or whatever and pick up all the bottles. And the best thing is they don't have to take them to a recycling plant or something. They just have the machines in the supermarket. So you just go into the supermarket with your bag and put all the, your bottles into the machine and give you a ticket. And then that ticket, you can either get cash from the, um, the supermarket teller, or you can use it to buy your groceries or whatever. So yeah, it works for homeless people, but because it's so easy to do at the supermarket, it it's like incentive for just regular people to do it as well, because it's like, oh yeah, I've just got like a pile of bottles in the corner of the kitchen, like, and I need to go buy some stuff in the supermarket. So you just put them in a crate or a bag or whatever, put them in there. And then you got your docket, buy your, your groceries and stuff, give them the docket and you get a discount off your groceries. So that system is really good. I think they really should do that. Um, like all you need to do is put the machines in, in the supermarkets and set up some infrastructure for, you know, the supermarkets get some money back for recycling the bottles. But yeah, that's a no brainer to me. Like they have it in Sweden and Finland and stuff as well. 
and that it's not so much the case here. Like I said, Berlin is kind of a dirty city where there's a lot of trash and glass and stuff everywhere. But in places like Sweden and Finland, it it you can see how well it works because people drinking in a park or something and then people will just like go, walk up to you while you're drinking and be like, yo, you want me to take any of your bottles? Just because they want to go and, you know, it's a homeless person that wants to go get some money or something. So you're like, I can visually see that this park is staying clean because there's an incentive for people to go around and clean it up. So, yeah, I think that system is really good. We should definitely do that in Australia. Uh, and on on drinking beer, there's another great thing about Berlin is that beer is really cheap. <laughs> like some places it's like, you know, it's always 500 ml cans. Um, I'm just going to check the time. Okay, I'm at an hour now. I'm going to go a bit over an hour. Um yeah, so you you always get half liter cans and in some supermarkets they're like 70 cents or something for a half liter, which is like, it's pretty, you know, it might not be the best beer, but it's super cheap. And even like spirits and stuff, very cheap. I don't want to sound like an alcoholic though, so I'm not going to talk about it for too long <laughs> and I actually haven't been drinking that much. Um, but the other cool thing is that you can drink on the street. And, you know, I'm not trying to say like, I want to be wild and go out and drink on the street, but it is nice that like, you know, if you're finishing work and you're just hanging out with some friends from work and you're going to walk to a, a, you know, a bar or somewhere or walk to a gig, you can just grab a beer at a corner store and just, you know, drink on the street. And in general, like you do see some crazy people that are really drunk on the street and being inappropriate and stuff. But in general, I don't think it's much worse than Australia. Like I think, I think if we introduced drinking on the streets in Australia now, it would be mayhem because everyone would just be like, yeah, we can drink on the street. But I think when people are used to it, like it's not really that different. It kind of, most of the time it's people just walking somewhere and having a drink on the way. And because you know, people want to give the, the bottles to people so they can get the refund. There's not bottles everywhere on the street because most people just put them, either keep them themselves or they'll put them like next to a bin so somebody can take them. Or like somebody will actually walk up to you and take your empties from you if you're okay with it. Even like lining up for a, a club or something, if people are drinking in the line at the club, they'll just put their bottles on the ground and there'll be like three people walking up and down the line just picking up people's bottles. So it works. Like you think drinking on the street would be mayhem, which it could be in Australia, but here it's, it's really not that bad. It's kind of just a nice thing. It's like, you don't have to be like looking out the, for the police. If you just got like a, a, a casual beer. Um, next thing I wrote is kebabs. <laughs> so I'm a bit of a kebab fiend. And, um, yeah, I think just because there's so many Turkish people here and it's just like so many good kebab shops, but also kebab, it kind of feels just like, it's almost like the, even though it's a Turkish thing, it's almost like the national food of Germany. <laughs> no, that's not true, but um, yeah, kebabs are good. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote that. Uh, clubbing, I've wrote is the next thing. Clubbing obviously in Berlin is awesome. Um, I feel like I came here I don't want to, I'm kind of scared to say it, but I might've come here at the end of an era. I'm not really sure. Like right now, I mean, well, not right now, but when I moved here, still clubbing was really awesome. But a lot of places have been closing down recently. Well, not a lot, but like a few major places that kind of institutions of Berlin have been closing down just because the building, whoever owned the building um, decided they want to use it for some other commercial, I don't know, whatever, but that's kind of sad. And, you know, people have been trying to predict like, is, you know, is the, is the government just like, is the, the local council or whatever, like the mayor, are they just going to let this culture of clubbing die in Berlin? Like, are they going to keep letting all these companies destroy all the clubs and stuff? And I don't really know what the answer is to that, but I will say there are still some, like amazing clubs here but this coronavirus is a whole other story like basically since everything's been locked down all the clubs on their 
Instagram pages and stuff have been saying like, you know, we're all struggling because this is our only form of income and everyone, they're all the clubs are asking for money from people and I guess they're getting some money, but it's like, I am worried to think what will happen to them um, and whether or not they can recover after this. So we'll see. But the reason why I put it in things that I do like is because, you know, I mention it because obviously I spent so much time in clubs in Melbourne being a DJ and I'm not necessarily someone who likes going clubbing that often. Um, but I mentioned it because, you know, everyone talks about Berlin being great for clubbing and you got to ask what, like, what is it about here that it's so much better? And I think a lot of it is just that they are a bit more like they, I think they just experiment a bit more. Like it seems like compared to Australia, generally in Australia, there's a, there's a, a formula that works. It's like find a cool venue, get, get a decent lineup, find some DJs, like promoter DJs who bring friends and stuff, get some other promoters that, you know, will bring a crowd, you know, push a bunch of stuff on Facebook as much as you can try and come up with some drink deals or whatever. And, you know, there's these little tricks to try and bring people in. But generally it's like the appeal of the club is the lineup, the venue, and yeah, I guess, you know, if you know people that go there or something like the, the crew that are working there. Yeah. Or if it's like a, a, a crew that, you know, that they've run a different club before, then, you know, okay, this is going to be good because they're running it. And I think it's the same thing here. It feels to me like they don't rely so much on, um, promoters. Um, and I, I guess that the way that they get away with it is by one thing, most of the venues are much better here. And what I mean by that is they're usually bigger and they're more interesting. Like it could be an old abandoned, um, not abandoned, but like an old apartment building or something like that, where you can actually walk through the building and there's like all these different rooms and stuff. And every room has like different lights and couches and shit in there. And there's like four different dance floors and you walk around through this building and you get completely lost. And then all of a sudden you're in a whole new dance floor with, you know, massive sound system and stuff. It's like, you can get lost in these places and they're just super impressive. So yeah, I think that the venues are more interesting and generally bigger and the sound systems are amazing, but also like most places will have something, some aspect or some room in, in the club, which is they're trying something a bit weird. And this is something that I think we need to do more of in Australia or club promoters need to do more is try some different stuff. Don't just stick to the same formula. Like here you have so many different events of things that are just completely wild. Like, and I'm not specifically talking about clubs here, but you'll have things like, uh, like exhibitions that you can go to where there'll be, where you can drink and party and stuff. Like for example, I can't remember who told me about this, but I, I saw there was this thing this place you could go to where it has like a big metal grate floor with like speakers under the floor. And the idea is that the whole room is like this 3d panning, like virtual soundscape where like sound like travels all around the room and stuff. Obviously that's expensive to set up, but you know, someone thought that that would be a cool idea and they tried it out or like, um, I saw this other event where people have like speakers in a little, like a vase and there's people just walking around like the venue with speakers in vases. So like the, the, the music is like traveling around <laughs> everywhere, which is, that was also like a, um, an exhibition kind of thing I saw. So it's not related to clubs, but it's just an example of people trying different stuff here. But when I talk about clubs doing that, um, for example, I went to, when I first traveled here, actually, um, a club called and it was their, I think their 12th birthday or 13th birthday, or maybe 11th or something like that. And, um, 
they had a lot of wild stuff going on there. Like this is the one I'm, I'm talking about that has, it's like an apartment building. And um, I feel like I shouldn't talk about it too much. Maybe I'll, I'll bleep out the name because in general, there's kind of an attitude here where it's like, you don't um, take photos inside clubs because, you know, one for people's privacy, but also it's like be there and experiencing experience it at the in the moment. Like it's not about um, showing it off on the internet or whatever. It's like, I guess maybe that's one of the secrets that Australia needs to think about is that not showing off too much about it on social media because it creates more of a curiosity and it, it means that, you know, you want to actually go there and see what it's really like there because it's more like secretive. So I don't know, maybe that's the thing, but generally most clubs, like when you walk through the door, they'll put a sticker over both the cameras on your phone. And people have this kind of attitude where if you see somebody taking a video or something, it's kind of frowned upon you. Most people like usually someone will walk up to them and say, Hey, don't do that here. Um, so for that reason, maybe I shouldn't talk too much about what was actually going on in the club, but, um, oh, fuck it. <laughs> I'll bleep out the name. Um, in this one place, it was their, at their birthday party and they had a, you know, everywhere in the building is like techno rooms, heavy techno playing through loud speakers. And then there was this one room, or a door, and there's someone standing at the door with these coupons and they, they give me this coupon and they're like, yeah, go downstairs. And there's this staircase. I'm like, okay, go down the stairs walk down this hallway and it's like, I'm in a cellar, like it's, it's like wet. It smells like you're in a cave. The roof is like this high. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on here. And then, um, you get to the end of the hallway and there's these, like, there's these swinging barn doors, like from an old saloon bar. And I walk through there and it is a saloon bar. <laughs> like all the bartenders and stuff are wearing like leather vests. They got cowboy hats the leather boots there's like honky tonk piano music playing and i'm looking around like i've just come from all the techno and stuff upstairs i'm like what is going on here <laughs> like i'm just so bewildered and i walk up to the bar i'm like what do i do with this the coupon it was like a looked like a hundred dollar bill and they're like point over to the corner of the room and there's a blackjack table there i'm like all right here we go i go and sit down at this blackjack table and give him the coupon and he deals me in, gives me some chips. I'm looking at the other people and I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Here? <laughs> but then you get used to it and you, all of a sudden you're sitting in this bar, like playing blackjack and the guy dealing was hilarious. Like you win a hand and he'd pour you a shot or like he would never say anything, but um, it's funny. There was one guy next to me. He was getting a little bit cocky and he won a hand and he's like, you know, yeah, like getting really excited and he's like, give me the chips. And the guy just stares him in the eyes, grabs all the chips and just gives them to somebody else and pours them a shot. <laughs> like, Just, you know, didn't give a shit. And it's like, you're not playing with money so they can kind of do whatever they want. But he's like, no, don't have that attitude. You, you know, you get too cocky and I'm going to give you shit to somebody else. <laughs> but yeah, it was funny. But yeah, something like that. I mean, they dedicated a whole room to that. <laughs> like, you don't see that in a club in Australia. And that's just one example. And that same night, there was even like three other rooms with totally crazy different things going on in them. Like totally not a general like music, you know, DJ playing in a dance floor and stuff. It was just crazy stuff. So yeah. That's why I think the clubs are better here is because they, they try weird stuff and it's, it's entertaining and that's what you're there for. You're there to have fun and to be entertained. So, yeah. Um, the, another thing, or well, the next thing I want to talk about things that I like, um, okay. One fifteen. uh, is, um, and something that I didn't know I would find before I came here is that there's a really cool jamming scene here. Uh, I don't want to sound like 
you know, real trendy, but um, I think in general, like it's hard to find, it's hard for me to find like band gigs to go to, like small bands and stuff. And the ones that I have seen, I think generally, um, you know, it's not as, it's not that great of an environment for bands to be playing here because the, usually you see somebody walking around with a hat while they're playing, like collecting coins from people. So I think like that kind of sucks. It seems like people aren't getting really paid that much to play gigs. Maybe I'm totally wrong. I don't know, but it seems harder for bands to get gigs and to make money here. But there is this sort of scene of people who have organized jam sessions. And a lot of the time, um, it'll be at a venue where you can drink beers and stuff as well. But if you're, a musician you can just bring along an instrument and you know it's a little bit like exclusive in a way that if you're really shit like they're probably try and tell you to get off the stage and <laughs> try and get somebody else to play and i haven't played yet in one of them for that reason is i'm kind of scared that like uh, i'm not up to the standard of these guys but i think that's that's really cool like that there's a scene for it and um yeah, I'm always hearing about new jams to go to and yeah, so that's really sick. Uh, and in the same sense, there's a lot of cool meetups here. Like um, actually the, re the way I got my job was through a, a music tech meetup. And I met some people who, like I met a guy who's the CEO of a company that I already knew about when I, from living in Australia. And he was super friendly to me, he gave me a whole list of um, companies to contact and stuff and then told me about the company that I'm actually working for now. And it was like, these guys are, you know, like exactly the kind of thing that you're looking for, like looking at your portfolio, you know, it perfectly suits your interests and everything. So yeah, if I didn't go to that meetup, I wouldn't have gotten this job. And so, yeah, I'm really thankful for that. And it's awesome that you can find people and places like that where you can, yeah, make connections with people and help, help each other out. So that was awesome. Um, the last point, the thing I love the most about Germany and Berlin, <laughs> and you're going to think this is ridiculous, but it's the internet. And it's just because probably the internet in Australia is so bad. Like, you know, I don't want to get political, but the liberals really fucked us with the internet. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say on that. Um, the MBN is a total failure. But yeah, most places I've lived in Australia, like I think the best internet I've ever had was like 12 megabits per second download. It, and I, I lived in Melbourne for seven years, like in inner suburbs. Like you would think living in the inner suburbs of the second biggest city in the country that you're going to have better internet, but it was always shit for me. So like 12 megabits downloads was the best I've ever had. And the place I was living before I left in Collingwood like Collingwood is very close to this CBD. The upload speed was like 0 0.8 megabits per second, which is like atrocious. But here uh, it's like 100 megabits download and 40 megabits upload. So I'm happy. I said when I left Australia, I was like, um, I was like, see you Australia, I'll be back when you fix the internet. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm happy with the internet here, hopefully. You know, because a lot of the stuff, like right now, I'm working from home, um, working remotely for this company because we're in lockdown. And I'm working with huge files, like CAD files and video files and stuff like that. So if I was working, if this was in Australia, it would be almost impossible for me. Well, not impossible, but it would be a lot more difficult. And I think the sooner the Australian government realizes that um, the, the, the quality of the internet is directly related to the economy because so much of the economy is online now that's you know if you don't give us good internet you're setting us up for failure in the future like with the economy and that's you know the the only thing that the liberal government cares about is the economy it's like well okay if you want the economy to be good then fix the internet because sorry to say but you're living in the past like we need good internet anyway that got political again but whatever um, so yeah, I need to finish. I'm on what an hour 20, I think an hour 30 will be my max. Uh, my camera just died. So I had to restart. 
So it seems like an hour 20 is probably about the limit of what I should shoot. Maybe I need to get one of those battery things that plugs into the wall. I need a bunch of different stuff, some lights and whatever. But anyway, I need to wrap this up. So to finish, yeah, that's the end of my rant. That's the stuff that, what, that I like about Germany before I came here. Some annoying things I found out about it since I got here. And what I still have found out, you know, new things that I like. And in general, I'm quite happy here. And I think I'm going to stay here for a while. I have a European citizenship now. So yeah, I'll probably stay here for a, a few years at least. Um, so I'm, I'm happy here. I like it. And hopefully I'll, I'll learn to speak German. <laughs> uh, so my shout outs this week are to, uh, like I said, I'm working for this tech company. It's called Mod Devices. Um, shout out to anyone who backed the Kickstarter because we launched a Kickstarter campaign. Um, we were aiming to raise 100,000 euros and we raised 212,000 with 798 backers. So it's awesome. It's way more than I expected. I, to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. I hadn't done a Kickstarter campaign before and it was crazy. Like, you know, we're sitting in the office and they're like, yeah, the, it's two o'clock. We've launched that campaign. We're like, sweet. We're all just like working away on our computers. And all of a sudden I just hear my boss, like 10 seconds later, he's like, oh, we're at 3K. I'm like, what? Did you just say 3K? And he's like, oh, we're at 5K. I'm like, 5,000? He's like, oh, seven. I'm like, Jesus Christ. It just blew up. Like it just went so quickly, especially in the beginning. But yeah, anyone who's supported um, us as a company and the product, um, yeah, thank you because I'm really excited about the product and I'm really loving my job as well. Um, so it's really great. And I know that it's going to be a really cool product too. So if you have backed it, then, um, you've got that to look forward to and I'll make sure of it. <laughs> um, yeah. And then just a shout out to everyone who watched the last video. Um, I know like, you know, if I suggest it to friends like, hey, like, can you watch this and tell me what you think? I know if you're not like a podcast listen, listener or something, you're like, oh, 45 minutes. And in this case, an hour 20. You're like, yeah, that's a long video to watch. But um, for the people who are interested in it and who did like it, um, thank you for watching it. And thank you for reaching out to me and um, letting me know your thoughts as well. Like all the people who gave me, you know, their, their feedback and everything. Um, you know, constructive criticism is also welcome, but there was a lot of positive feedback, um, which was really nice. So thank you. And if you've got anything to say about this, if you want to tell me how this one's way too long, <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead and, and let me know. But yeah, it was really nice um, hearing from people, you know, especially the people who it kind of resonated with, who they were like, um, yeah, I've had the same experiences and, and I really felt what you were saying here. So yeah, it means if I feel like I'm not speaking to a, an empty room with a camera. <laughs> so it's good. I really appreciate it. So until next time, see you later.